Happy Easter, everyone. Today's the day that we celebrate that Jesus came back from the dead after being executed on a Roman cross. And uh, the cross back then was actually a symbol of torture and of, of death. But today, the cross is a symbol of hope, right? And so that's the theme of this year's Easter message. It's hope. And you know, I am aware of so many people that are in desperate need of hope right now. Just in the people that I know well, I'm aware of some significant challenges, uh, relational challenges, marriages really struggling, friendships on the verge of uh, breaking up, you know, financial problems, job issues, people that own companies, issues with that, legal problems, depression, anxiety, fear. I'm just aware of people struggling with all of those things. And you know, some of us have recently lost loved ones to illness or accidents or even suicide. And you know, the rapid rate, the rapid increase in suicide is a strong indicator that our society is hopeless because people don't want to end it unless they don't have any more hope, right? Now, for most of us, you know, we find different ways to escape our suffering, don't we? But none of them really work. If we look to the things of the world to escape our pain, it almost always makes things worse, doesn't it? So what we really need in rough times is hope. Hope that everything's going to be okay. Hope that we're going to be okay. Hope that we get to see our loved ones that we've lost again. We need hope. And you know what? That is the message of Easter. It's the ultimate message of hope. But it's so easy to somehow get disconnected with the troubles that we experience in this life and the message of hope that's found in the resurrection. And one of the reasons for that disconnect is that we tend to think of the resurrection like we think of the Easter bunny. <laughs> you know, it's just a nice story. It's a, it's a fairy tale or something like that. We can forget that the resurrection of Jesus was an actual historic event that took place in space and time. And even for those of us who believe that, you know, somehow we can fail to grasp how that resurrection connects to what we're going through in life. So today, I just want to take some time and look at this connection between hope and the resurrection of Jesus. And our text today is going to come out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you want to turn there in your Bible or your Bible app, and follow along, I think that that will be helpful uh, because we're going to cover some ground. Um, and basically, this section of Scripture is the Apostle Paul uh, reminding the church in Corinth of the resurrection and the importance of the resurrection. So let's start in verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would Come and open our hearts, 
open our minds to the true message of hope that's found in the resurrection. Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing I want to point out about that passage that we just read that is that he starts out by addressing it to brothers and sisters, right? Well, that means that Paul was writing this letter to believers, just like you and me. That's important. You'll see why in a minute. But one of the main reasons he wrote the letter in the first place was that um, the church at Corinth was having different divisions They were arguing about some things. One of the things that they were arguing about was the resurrection. Some people didn't believe that resurrection could happen. Okay? So Paul begins with a really strong challenge to those people. And he reminds them about what he preached all along. That Jesus really lived that he actually did die and was buried and that he actually did rise from the dead. And then he cites several names. He mentions people who actually saw Jesus die and then saw him alive again. In fact, he says that at one point, over 500 people at the same time saw Jesus alive after they saw him die. Okay, so what's Paul saying here? He's saying, listen, it actually happened. It actually happened. And if you don't believe that, then your belief is in vain. But not everybody did believe it. It says in verse 12, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, remember who he's writing this to. He's writing this letter to people that claim to follow Jesus. Are you catching this? There were actually Christians that didn't believe in resurrection. And you know what? There still are today. To this day, some people don't believe that. Maybe people hearing my voice right now don't believe in a risen king. But I want to challenge you. What real hope is there if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? I mean, because that would mean that we're still in our sin and we'll always be in our sin. That means that there is no resurrection for us. That means we will never see our loved ones that are gone again. In fact, Paul goes as far as to say in verse 19... If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Strong words. Why are we most to be pitied? Because think about this. If there is no resurrection, what's the point of living an eternal focused life? What's the point of storing up treasures in heaven if we're never going to see it. It's like Paul said in verse 32, I think. He says, you know, if, there is no, if the dead don't rise, then we should just eat and drink because tomorrow we die. In other words, live it up now because that's all you get. You see the implications? Now, of course, this doesn't mean that there's no hope in this life for following Jesus. Of course there is. There's plenty of benefit to following Jesus here and now. But it all pales in comparison to the hope of eternity, doesn't it? So what is Paul saying here? He's saying, if only we have hope in Christ for eternity or for here then we are missing out on the most substantial, significant part of our hope. The big part isn't found here. So the first point I want to make this morning is there is no real hope without a real resurrection. Come on. None of this touchy-feely, nice religious stuff. 
Jesus actually rose from the dead. If he didn't, we don't have any hope. This is a very important point. Why? Because having an eternal perspective, listen to me. Having an eternal perspective, it changes how we think about everything. Everything. Why? Because it shapes our expectations. Do you catch that? Having, a, having an eternal perspective shapes our expectations, and expectations are intimately connected with hope. Intimately. As I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of loved ones that are struggling right now. That, that's many of you. I said, what we need in times like that is hope, right? We need hope. But hope is tricky because of this connection between expectations and hope. You see, we don't hope for what we already have, do we? That doesn't make any sense. What do we hope for? Our hope is for something future, something that we want to receive some event or thing that we hope or expect or desire. In other words, it's connected with expectation. And expectation can set us up for disappointment. Very key to catch this. Expectation can set us up for disappointment. And disappointment is the enemy of hope. I was talking to one of my friends recently, and I've known him for many years. He's a good friend, and he has been struggling with a specific thing off and on for years. And he said to me during this conversation, I don't understand what God's doing. You know, I, I serve him. I give generously to his work. I belong to him. I don't understand what he's doing. And you know what my response was? God's not doing this. And he said, I know. And he really does know. But see, even though we know, it's not God causing our trouble. Somehow we still think that way. Why? Why do we think that way? Because we have expectations of God. Of course we do. We expect God to do what he says he's going to do, don't we? We expect his promises to be true. And to be sure, there are promises in Scripture that there will be blessing for following God. Here's one of them. So don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. There's the promise. Promise of blessing for following God. But did you know there's also promises that we are going to experience trouble? Here's one. This is Jesus' words. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. There it is. There is a hope that's only found in an eternal perspective. Jesus is saying here, yep, you're going to struggle. Bad things are going to happen. But don't worry too much about that because I've overcome all of it. I've overcome all of it. Now, some people... When they hear that, they go, Greg, isn't that escapism? And to that I say, heck yeah. (laughs) It is escapism, but it's the right kind of escapism. What do you mean? Well, remember earlier I said that if we look only to worldly things for our escape, 
that it almost always ends in making things worse, right? I said that if you lean to things of the world, if you look to the things of the world to bring you hope, it'll actually make things worse. Why? Because very simply, it's not grounded in eternal reality. It's focused on this tiny breath of a life. It's a very myopic view of who we are. If you look to drugs or alcohol or sex, they can never bring you hope. Now, all those things actually have a proper place. You know, they can actually be a blessing if they're kept in their proper place. But if you look to them for freedom from your pain, they actually do the exact opposite. Instead of bringing freedom, they bring bondage. They bring addiction. If you look to them for hope, you're going to be very sorely disappointed. And what is the disappointment? Disappointment is unmet expectations. <laughs> that leads to the next point I want to make. Real hope requires that we have the right expectations. Real hope requires that we have the right expectations. See, we need to understand the limitations of earthly things in helping us through our troubles. Very limited. They don't bring hope. But most importantly, we need to have the right expectations of God. Somehow we Christians, we remember all the good promises, don't we? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. But we forget the one that goes, in this world you will have trouble. But see, even, even in the promise of trouble, there's attached infinite hope. I have overcome the world. <laughs> I transcend the world. Nothing in this life can separate you from my love, from my plan for you. If you are in Jesus, your eternal future is secure. Nothing can separate you from that. That is hope. but it, it never looks like we expect it to, does it? I mean, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem for the triumphal entry, the people thought that he was coming to be inaugurated as king, to overcome uh, the oppression by the Romans, to establish the throne of kingdom, uh, the kingdom of David, the throne of David. And just a few days later, he was executed. <laughs> Can you imagine how that must have felt for the disciples? That's not what they expected. They were incredibly disappointed, I'm sure. But that very event... Three days later, led to something they could never expect. <laughs> he rose from the dead. He conquered death. Get the religious paradigm out of your head and comprehend this thought. Jesus overcame death.
You see, our expectations of God aren't too big. Oh, I don't want to put too much pressure on you, God. Our expectations of God are way too small. Come on. Our expectations aren't too big. They are way too small. See, when we experience trouble in this life, even significant trouble like the loss of a loved one, we can't get our heads around how God could use something like that for our good, can we? (laughs) The disciples were grieving the loss of Jesus. They were broken, hurting, confused, lost. But the best thing ever came from that. Do you see it? Now, I'm not dismissing the pain that we experience. I personally have experienced tremendous pain in my life in seasons. And it is so hard to endure. It's so hard to navigate. But whatever you're going through, the answer is not to escape the thing. The answer is hope. The answer is hope. Do you have hope? Do you really believe everything's going to be okay? No matter what happens here? I want to close by sharing an experience that I've been going through for the past two weeks. Um, Many of you know Rick and Jane White. For those of you that don't know them, they are the people who personally made it possible for us to be moving into this new building. If it was not for them, this would not be our last service here. And Rick has personally given countless hours to help us in so many different ways. And he's done all this at no cost to us. They are kingdom-minded people of God. They are incredibly generous. They have given to make it possible for over 200 churches to have their own facility. That's the kind of people they are. This is their son, Jason. Two weeks ago yesterday, Jason took his own life. It was heartbreaking. And I'm sharing about this because of the the struggle that I've had with it over these past two weeks. It's been profound, and what God has spoken to me has been profound to it, and I'm hoping that this will help some of you. See, the truth is I really struggled with this. I really struggled with this. I thought, if this can happen to Rick and Jane people who have given their whole life to serve the church and sacrifice their own personal wealth so that other people can find hope in Jesus? If it can happen to them, then none of us are safe. Now, most of this was just happening in the back of my mind. But back there, I started to even be concerned for my own family. Some people are afraid to step out and serve God because they see what happens to people who serve God. The truth is, it happens to all of us. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. And if a few days of, of struggling through this thing in my soul, you can ask my wife, I was down. I was really discouraged. I was 
maybe even a little bit confused. But a few days of that, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was just praying and processing all of this with God, and I just said, God, how could this happen to Rick and Jane? People who have given so much for the kingdom. And I felt the Lord speak to me. And he said, this is why they do what they do for the kingdom. This is why what they do for the kingdom is so important. And then my mind flooded with these thoughts. And I realized, it was like a light went on. And I realized just in this one church that they've helped, I'm aware of a few different people who have had significant struggles with suicide. At least one of them that I know of attempted it more than once. And through the ministries of Renovate, they're not struggling with that anymore. He brought to mind the marriages that would be decimated, but because of the counseling and ministries and teachings of Renovate, their marriage is intact and growing. He brought to mind the people that have fought depression and are now on their way to successful joy. The people that were addicted and now are free. The people who had no one to love them and now they have a thriving community of people, a bunch of people loving on them. And I went, oh. You see, Jason is a casualty of the spiritual war that's raging to destroy people. Scripture says the devil has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's his mission. And the church is God's safe harbor for them. It's the place that they can go to receive healing, repair, help, to renew their mind. The demonic thinking that has taken a hold of them and made their life so miserable that they want to end it. They lost all hope and they want to end it. When hope is restored, life is restored. It's not a matter of what happens. It's a matter of hope. And I felt God say to me, Greg, don't be discouraged by the victims of the, of the battle because it's for them that you do this. It's for the lost. It's for the, the, the hopeless. And you know what? I am not discouraged. I am not confused. Not only that, I have a renewed passion for what we do. Not only that, I see clearly that even in the most tragic circumstances, God will bring beauty from the ashes. Like it says in Isaiah 6. Beauty from the ashes. What does that mean? (laughs) Think about this. From a gruesome execution, God brought salvation to all mankind. Beauty from ashes. There's hope not only despite suffering, there is hope because of suffering. There's no Easter without a Good Friday. There's no resurrection without a death. A seed cannot grow and bear fruit unless it first falls to the ground and gets buried.
beauty from ashes. And I saw this beautifully illustrated at Jason's memorial service. Hundreds of people showed up to bless the family. I was one of them. Susan and I were one of them, two of them, one of them. At this service, it came out that Jason had surrendered his life to Jesus before he passed. Not only that, as the result of an invitation at the end of this memorial service, 15 other people came to Jesus. Some of you may say that, but Greg, losing a loved one is unbearable. And I agree with you. God agrees with you. So he did something about it. Look what he did. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that has been written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? You see, this verse shows that why Easter is a time of celebration, not a time of mourning. Death itself has been swallowed up in victory. That's something to be excited about if you really believe it. <laughs> Death isn't the final word. Death is the enemy of God. And according to verse 26, it's the final enemy to be destroyed. Death itself will be destroyed. So don't let the events of this life steal your hope. It will bring pain. It will steal your happiness for a while. But don't let it steal your hope. Because this life, this life is only a tiny fraction of all of God's reality. Believers, get your head right. This life is a fraction of reality. And when you realize that, you will have the ultimate hope and nothing will be able to take it. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for hope of resurrection. Breathe life into those that are going through rough times right now, God. Restore their hope. And from that hope, restore their joy. And God, let them be built on the rock that no matter what storms of life come, they are built on a firm foundation and they will never be shaken. You are that foundation. And the pillar of that foundation is the resurrection. So thank you for the resurrection. So a couple of things that are coming to me, and I just ask that you would just keep your eyes closed and let the Holy Spirit speak to you right now. Oftentimes, even believers don't have hope. And that the reason for that is they don't have the right expectations of God. So if that's you this morning and you just need God to restore immovable hope in your life, raise your hand real quick so I can pray for you. I'm not going to make you do anything else. Yes, yes. Just raise your hand long enough for me to see it and you can put it down.
You need hope restored. Several all over this room. And secondly, maybe you don't have this kind of hope because you're not in right relationship with God. (laughs) You know, you can change that right now very, very simply. And I want to give you a chance to, to do that right now, to just say yes to God. It is that simple. That's what launches you. Say yes to God. If that's you, if you're not sure where you're going when you die, if you don't know what's going to happen, if you're not sure you're right with God, just put your hand up long enough for me to see it. Yes. Others. You don't know where you're going. You're not sure of your salvation. I'm just waiting because I sense in my spirit there's more of you here. Well, how do you know if that's you? Because there's a battle going on in your head right now. I'm not going to do that. I see that one. Others. You don't have to have all your questions answered. You don't have to have it all figured out. You're just going, help me, God. I need you. Yes. 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 Jesus always called people to respond publicly. Because if you mean it, go for it. Who cares what other people think if they're peeking? Anyone else? Yep. Yep. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray that all of those that responded in front of this community and most importantly in front of you, restore hope, God, to the believers that maybe have their expectations a little twisted or off or maybe their expectations just don't translate into practical thought. In whatever case, God, I pray that their firm foundation would be shored up and you would bring hope. And I pray for all those that said yes for the first time to you, God. Breathe life into them. Can we all just pray this prayer together out loud? Jesus, I give my life to you. I surrender to you. And I ask you to bring me hope. In Jesus' name. Amen. The angels in heaven are rejoicing right now.